so first it was shock because like shit I've never seen that look on my face or I don't even remember ever seeing my face look that way and secondly there was delight it was like oh my gosh like that's the real real like that was just so authentic in the sense that whatever I was feeling whatever I was going through it was okay for that to be what was snapped on camera. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Preparing for Pregnancy After Loss podcast. This is your host, Natalie Facey, and I am just so grateful that you're here. So grateful that we get to spend the time together. You might hear different sounds in my background from our last recording. So this time I am in the big city, the Big Apple area. And I realize that when I'm surrounded by so much nature and, you know, that usually feels like just home, right? Just being in nature, there is this life force that I connect with and what occurred to me this morning is that there's just a different life force in New York right there there's a different sense of aliveness in New York so while in our last recording there were the trees and the birds and the breeze and just so much greenery this time there's a different energy that I can actually appreciate and usually you know I might complain about the noise or the yada yada just like the fullness of everything and it's like oh it it's also this place that is rich with diversity and creativity and things happening all the time and different people from different countries and continents and you know, pursuing what for them is life-giving, pursuing their dreams. And it's like, yeah, there's, there's a way that I can also celebrate that. So just naming that. Today, that's my setting. And naming how very rich and beautiful that is, even though it's different from where I typically am, which is, or typically am these days, which is, been surrounded by a lot of quiet and a lot of greenery so with all of that said it feels so good to be here with you and it feels good that regardless of where I am there's a sense of grounding that this connection creates right it doesn't matter where I am I'm able to connect with you in this way and so welcome if you're new welcome back if you're not new and you know I've thought of creating like a intro to the podcast which I used to have one earlier on but I'm sure that things have evolved since then since then (laughs) this is also (laughs) the effect of spending a lot of time in the Caribbean where I go back to my Jamaican patois it's like the the th's become d's (laughs) so since then becomes since then (laughs) And that's been funny because I legit, you know, just don't remember English words sometimes. <laughs> or in, in doing conjugation of verbs, I have the wrong, you know, the wrong verb conjugation set up. So, yeah, it's, it's funny the ways that our bodies and our being changes or molds and takes different shape and can do different things based on the environment that we're in right like I was saying maybe an intro to the podcast is that this is the space where I am really looking to create a sense of community in the midst of an experience that can feel really really isolating so I actually find it just really so precious that in going through an experience such as a loss you know infertility diagnosis anything related to a loss connected to the womb w-o-m-b 
it it causes a lot of shame it causes a lot of shame and so most people are like silenced in that shame and we including myself get to be in a space that leads to inspiration be in a space that creates this experience of being seen and being understood and hopefully that also leads to self-empowerment so that we can begin moving out of our shells, begin moving out of the, the closed space, the space that we have retreated to in order to feel a sense of protection from the world. So it feels really special that I get to be a part of that nurturing, a part of the nurturing of that space. And even though for many of you, I have not met you in person, <laughs> I still feel a connection. And I know that most people feel a connection because when I finally meet someone who's been listening to the podcast for, you know, two years, three years, there's just this level of excitement and this level of like, yeah, we're friends. I know you. <laughs> I've been listening to the podcast. I know you like you, you know, you've been in my kitchen. You've been in my car. <laughs> you've been with me as I've been going on walks, you know. You know, you've been with me as I, I do work and, and want to hear some encouraging voice in the background. Like, yeah, we're good. We know each other. And so that to me is just such a gift. Like I'm almost being moved to tears. I'm a water sign. I don't know if I mentioned that to anyone. <laughs> so that just feels super, super special. Yeah. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence and your energy and even your asking because sometimes I, in, in deciding what topic to speak to for the podcast episode, I basically sit and ask, what is it that wants to be said? You know, sit and, you know, connect with what I consider to be this divine intelligence that has access to the entire universe like I, I tap into that energy and ask what what wants to be known what wants to be said and so I believe that in your asking in you having a desire in you putting out your question in you putting out a request for how you'd want to be supported then I might be inspired to share that, right? It, it occurs to me as an idea and I've, I've really stopped claiming things as mine. <laughs> I've really started to think of it as this is flowing through me versus I came up with this, right? Because I know that everything is a collaboration with this divine intelligence. So when the ideas show up, you know, there's a way that I can approach that with humility knowing that I am practicing listening versus this is mine and I came up with it it's like mm, it was floating in the air or it might have come to me because I have also been asking like how can I serve people how can I support people in their healing journey and so in, in me asking the question and in you putting out the request there's a way that it comes to my inbox <laughs> it it comes to my mind and if it feels aligned to share then I say yes and then I share and so this definitely is one of those things that have been coming up and you know they might come up in different occasions and and this this has come through a few times and so I just started putting some notes together yeah, thanks for hearing that. I realized that I could have just jumped into the episode, but it felt important to just settle into my intention for today and connect with you. And then we can go from there. All right, so let's go. 
So the working title that I have for this episode is around, well, not the working title, the idea, <laughs> because I, usually when it's done, I'm like, okay, that's a title, but it's around smiling for the camera. <laughs> and then the other title I had in mind is like, why are we smiling? Because really, if, if, if we're not feeling the emotions that lead to smiling, why are we smiling? So there are a few observations that I have made, and that includes noticing that we, as a society, teach children to smile for the camera. <laughs> and so in someone, you know, taking a photograph of them, whether with their phone or one of those professional cameras or whatever, we encourage them to smile and as we get older and we've learned that when someone is trying to take a photo of you, you smile, that's what you do. I can then connect that to, it's like when we are being observed, when we're, when we're being seen, when someone else is in our presence, then we smile or we put on the... I can call it the mask. We put on the face or the mask that is presentable, right? Presentable to the camera or presentable to the observer, the person who's with us. <laughs> there, there are other experiences too, or like other things that we say in our culture. You know, so you might have heard this thing around turn your turn that frown upside down. <laughs> And that frown becomes the smile. You might have also heard, or you might have had the experience where you're walking on the street and someone asked why you weren't smiling or tried to encourage you to smile. I don't know how I feel about that one. Like I've heard, young lady, smile. <laughs> and, you know, if I connect this to any feminist ideas then i i can enter into a state of annoyance and then you know give someone a lecture as to why i have the right to have any expression on my face that i want to have and i also know that it's coming from a place of let me say men because it's men men who've done this in my experience and i know that it's coming from a place of wanting to make a connection right wanting to connect so I can see it from that perspective and at the same time I can see it from the perspective of, yeah, culturally women are expected to be more pleasant, women are expected to smile and in being presentable and approachable, the expectation is that there's a smile on your face and I don't see men approaching men <laughs> asking them to smile. I do not. <laughs> Maybe it happens. I have not seen it. <laughs> so I could go down that road, but I'll just say that culturally culturally and across our society it's this expectation that in order for you to present yourself to the world in order for you to be acceptable in the world then there are certain emotions that are not appropriate to show and there are other emotions or there are other facial expressions that people want to see and there are other ideas that have been coming to mind. It's like, you know, if when children are having a temper tantrum, and, and really, I hope talking about children doesn't lead to triggers, but I'm really going back to childhood because I think that's where it starts, right? I think that these are where we learn the patterns that evolve and take new shape and take more meaning as we become adults you know so if as a child I was in this state of annoyance or anger or whatever I don't think my parents did time out no we didn't do time out <laughs> but there is there is this experience of like go go sit in a corner until you figure yourself out like go you know go over there and fix your face and come back you know, so it's this experience of like, stay isolated until you are presentable again, 
right? Go in that back room, go in that corner, go somewhere else until you can show up the way that you're expected to show up in this world. And I, I, yeah, I find it interesting to make that connection because so many of the emotions that we'll go through in processing loss, so many of the experiences that we'll, we'll go through, they don't involve smiling. They do not involve smiling. They might involve being in states of anger, regret, they might involve tears. They might involve deep emotional pain. It, it, very few of the emotions and the experiences after going through a loss will involve smiling. There might be moments of feeling grace and gratitude and some sweet emotions. But I would say in general, it's a really difficult time to navigate. You know that. And it won't typically involve smiling. I came across something <laughs> recently that I want to share with you as well. And it's a photograph that was taken of me in high school. And it isn't one of like the, the pose for the camera photographs with like friends and that sort of stuff. It's a photo for an ID card. And when I looked at my face, I tell you, I, haven't, I don't remember seeing my face like that ever. There was no smile. Like, <laughs> smiling was on a whole other planet from where my face was. Like, my, my lips were kind of, you know, pouted out. And not in this state of anger. Like, I, I wasn't, like, in this emotional state of, like, anger or annoyed that was showing on my face. It was just like, yeah, this is, this is what's here right now. This is what's here either in my life right now or in this moment right now. It's hard for me to describe it, but there was no smile. Like lips puffed up, you know, face closed in, no smile, no trying to be pleasant, no, no trying to put anything on for the camera. Like that, that's what was there. So first it was shock because like, shit, I've never seen that look on my face or I don't even remember ever seeing my face look that way. And secondly, there was delight. It was like, oh my gosh, like that's the real, real, like that was just so authentic in the sense that whatever I was feeling, whatever I was going through, it was okay for that to be what was snapped on camera, right? There was no awareness that I needed to put anything on for anyone else. And maybe I was just at a stage in my life where I never even thought of putting anything on for anyone else, right? Yeah, like this is what's here right now. And it's really making me wonder <laughs> if, if someone were to take like a, a group high school photograph where people, where the, the students, the children were authentically themselves in that moment where they weren't trying to stand in <laughs> some kind of order and where they weren't trying to hold a smile for however long the photographer takes to get everyone in said order where where there was no pretending you know like you'd have people screwing up their face you'd screwing up their face I don't know if you know what that expression means but you'd have people like having a frown on or like whatever expression they want you'd have people giving the middle finger <laughs> You'd have people turning their back. You would have people being expressive with their hands. You'd have the big smiles. You'd have the crying. You'd have everything. And, you know, in, in my mind now, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, you, you know what just came to mind? It looks like attempting to take a photograph with a group of babies. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is legit what came to mind because I was like, wait, that sounds like utter chaos. And I'm like, hmm, this sounds like taking a photograph with a whole bunch of babies. And guess why? Because they are their authentic selves. They are the full expression of themselves. They are the expression of hunger, the expression of annoyance, the expression of being tired, the expression of being happy, the expression of laughing, the expression of all the things because the world hasn't taught them yet that in order to be acceptable, then you stay in line, you sit still or stand still and smile. And I wonder if there could be a world or if there could be spaces or pockets of spaces in the world where we make room for that, where we make room for our authentic expression. And that's now making me think of the time that I've spent in an eco-village where most of the folks there practice nonviolent communication or compassionate communication. And that's a tool that really helps people to identify and express what their feelings are moment to moment and what their needs are that are either being met or not being met connected to those feelings. And so in taking a walk in this eco-village, I might come across someone and ask, hey, how are you doing? And I will get a genuine answer, like how this person is actually doing. I might hear, you know, I'm actually going through some grief right now. Yeah, there's some stuff that came up with my partner, or there's some stuff that came up with this family member and it's a really really tough time so yeah I'm moving through that now thanks for asking and I just love that because that again feels like the just this realness this authenticity and the the other side of that like you know as I said that you may, you may have noticed what came up in your body. There might have been some tightness hearing someone else talk about their grief and that they're going through a really hard time. And if that showed up, then I consider that as being the, the part of us that may want to fix it or the part of us that may be worrying, I don't know how to respond to this. I don't know what to do with this. Is this person expecting me to, like, what do I say? And what I've also learned is that there isn't an, a need to fix anything, to do anything or say anything in this person sharing. Sometimes the greatest need has already been met, the need to share, the need to be authentic. And other times... It could be that there is a need for witnessing or a need to be understood, a need to receive some empathy. And so I might respond with that, right? Just being with the person and feeling into the emotions that they're holding a little bit and just acknowledging that, yeah, that does sound really hard and I'm so sorry that you're going through that. And the simple act of being present with that person, of making eye contact, of bodies being present and co-regulating with each other, of slowing down with that person, of them knowing that in this moment you are present with them, in this moment they have your attention, the simple act of that is balancing. The simple act of that is healing. It's grounding. And I might ask if they would want a hug. And if they say yes, then I would offer a hug and be present as I'm offering that hug. Just be with that person. What I find in those experiences is that, like for me, there's actually an expansion 
and I don't experience the tightness of, oh, what do I do? Like, how do I fix it? How do I make it better? Like, what do they want me to do? Ah, this is so much. I used to experience that and, you know, have learned over time that, yeah, we're not trying to fix anything. You know, people mostly want to be seen and heard and understood. And when I have felt that, being seen and heard and understood and not having the experience of someone trying to give me advice or tell me how to make it better or try to problem solve, just the presence has been a beautiful, grounding and supportive experience. And so I'm naming that as... You know, we don't have a world where there is this openness to all of the experiences, right? We, we just don't have a world that teaches that. We don't have a world that practices enough of those tools for it to be resourceful and balancing for people. If, if you know, more people or if everyone were as authentic with their emotions. But I do like that this is an example of what it could look like. I do like that it's, yeah, it's an example of what it could look like. And so instead of wearing a mask, what would it look like to normalize our different experiences? Right, what, what would it look like to show up in a space with your sadness and be welcomed and be met, right? And have someone ask, how are you? How are you doing? And for you to be able to say, I'm feeling a lot of sadness. Yeah, I've been feeling a lot of sadness. There are some days that are easier and for the most part, it feels really, really hard. And for you to be met in that space, for you to be held, for you to be offered hugs. And actually going back, not offered hugs, but for you to be asked, what do you need? Can I offer you a hug? Do you want, do you want your space? How can I support you? That feels so good. Like as I sit with that, I can just feel the softening in my belly, I can feel this like warmth in my heart to know that this possibility exists for us to show up as we are. Show up with the emotions that we're holding and to be able to communicate, this is what's happening and this is what I need. Yeah, that feels really, really beautiful. So I'm really wanting to call in this experience of showing up as you are, of coming as you are. If you're needing rest, receiving rest. If you're upset, receiving what you need to be able to express that, to be able to feel seen and understood. If you're sad, receiving what you need to be able to be with that. Because I realize that when we are expected to show up differently, when we're expected to hide the sadness, the anger, the regret, when we're expected to hide those experiences, we learn to associate them with shame. And shame leads to isolation. If we are put into this place of considering the, the natural experiences that we're having, the natural reaction of anger, of, of fear or sadness and grief, if we're expected to assign shame to those experiences, then we essentially feel forced into cutting off parts of our normal, natural expression. And in doing so, cutting off parts of ourselves, right? Not being allowed to show up as you are. Being in the corner of the world or somewhere else until you're better, until you can fix up yourself, right? Until you can fix your face. 
Yeah, and I'm not wanting that for myself. I'm not wanting that for you. I'm not wanting that for anyone. And I'm not wanting that for the generations to come. Yeah, what I'm wanting is our liberation. And what I'm wanting is... Ah, liberation in its most expansive state. And I do believe that the more that we step into our liberation, it's the more that we expand it so that those to come step into even more of it. Right? Step into even more of it. And I also recognize that the world that we live in right now is it's not that world, right? It's not that world. And so what would it look like to create the spaces where you know that you can be met? Or what would it look like to be a part of the spaces where you know that you can be met, right? With that empathy, with that understanding, with that grace. I'm trying to remember the details of this exactly, but I, I I do remember that I was in the midst of grief and I think I was invited to something and I remember saying, this is what's going on with me right now. I, I might show up, but know that if I show up, I might have to pop out when I need to. You know, so it, it felt important to be there. And at the same time, it was also important for me to understand what I was going through and not feel the need to have a mask on the entire night. And so the person who was organizing it, I basically said, OK, this is how I'm showing up. Right. I'm, I'm happy to be here to connect with family to be in this loving energy and I might get to a point of feeling full I might get to a point of having some emotion feel as though it's taking me over and I'm just going to leave or I'm going to be in the bathroom if I need to cry and I need some space and I need some alone time from all of the energy that's here so that was me giving myself the permission to be whatever version of me wanted to express itself that night. And it also felt safer emotionally for me to say to the person who was coordinating this, this is, this is what I'm coming with. This is how I'm entering into the space. And to know that that was already there, right? Like I, I could already be met in that way. So I wanted to name that as an example of how to create those spaces for yourself, create those spaces that feel safer emotionally for yourself. You can also have someone with you that supports you in doing that. So you can have a good friend with you or someone else who just is able to tune into your energy and what you're needing in this moment. And I'm not saying partner and, you know, I might need to dive into some of what's been coming up for me around partners and it's because they're going through stuff too you know and so if if the partner who's not the birthing person if they're put into the position of being the protector being the space holder it means that there is less there's less time and energy and spaciousness that's there for them Right. So sometimes if, if especially if they're male bodied, they definitely do fall into the role of the protector. Like it is assumed <laughs> that they take on that role. And I just want to acknowledge that, yeah, they also experience a loss because they also, you know, had this desire for for the child, right? For the baby, for the little one to join you. Yeah, so just wanted to name that and that there's a way that other friends or family members who aren't as impacted can hold space for you. So that's one example. And then the other is that there are already these spaces that I've, I've now been calling liberatory spaces. There are already these spaces so that when you open the door, it's like, yeah, come on in. Come on in with everything. 
come on in with everything with all that you're holding with all that you're navigating with all that you're going through like we see you come on in what do you need how can we support you and i definitely feel that for different communities that i've been in whether it's been online or in person and it's also a space that i am dedicated to holding whether i am in a private session or i'm in a group session it's like come as you are you know say that i've gone out somewhere and i'm wearing jewelry and a head wrap and bra gosh <laughs> and all these things by the time i come through my door everything has to go anything that is in a position of this new state of being more relaxed it has to go the head wrap has to go the earrings have to go any form of jewelry have to like my most naked self it's like what's the thing that really supports my sense of comfort so i think of that as i hold space for people it's like what's the thing that supports your sense of comfort is like how can you let your hair down right and i don't have long hair right now but how can you just release all the things that would represent putting on any any anything for the world in this moment when you're wanting to be in a state of ease and peace like what supports that are you doing this session from your bed hell yeah <laughs> are you i sit on the floor a lot because it it just feels comfortable are you doing it from the floor yes are you wearing clothing that is comfortable and that feels good yes do you have a pillow supporting your back yes is your camera off because you don't want to look at anybody right now yes <laughs> or is your camera on because you want to be seen in this version of your nakedness yes right so like what are the spaces that already have liberation as the baseline the spaces where you can come as you are where you can come as you are and it's so important to either you know create those spaces by letting people know this is how i'm showing up this is what's present you should probably expect this don't feel bad i'm doing me <laughs> or being in those spaces that already have that as the way they operate and you know i i would choose the latter if it's available right just being in those spaces that already have that as the way that they operate because it creates a level of exhale and release that we do not typically experience in the world it, yeah it, it creates this like rest in our bodies this rest in our nervous systems that we do not typically experience in the world and so if you know i think of it as like running around a racetrack over and over and over and over just like nervous system going active on running 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 and if there can be these moments of pause and sweet soft breathing of rest of getting some cool air some cool breeze of drinking some refreshing lemonade or coconut water or cucumber water if there can be this moments of just rest then the gift that that is to our bodies and to our being the gift that that is in regenerating us resourcing us right and so yeah it feels so so important to have those spaces yeah so i wanted to name that and also wanting to offer this reminder of showing up as you are right so there's you know there's a way that even in the spaces that don't practice this level of welcoming don't practice this level of openness to different ranges of emotions 
what is it like to experiment with that, right? To show up at the meeting and not feel the need to smile? To show up at the meeting on Zoom and not feel the need to go on camera? What is it like to have these little experiments with showing up as you are, right? To push the boundaries just a little. Like, what is it like if I don't actually feel like smiling and I don't smile? What is it like to give myself that permission to be versus hold myself to some standard created by systems of oppression? What is it like for me to not oppress myself in this moment? To not force myself into doing something that doesn't feel true, that doesn't feel authentic? What could that be like? Right, Having that be the experiment and seeing how that goes. <laughs> And overall, I would say the invitation is to show up as you are, whatever that feels like, and getting the support when you need to do so. And if you don't have the space to do so, it's like when, when you are in your space and when you have support, you know, seeing how much of that you can expand. Hmm. All right, that feels complete. That feels complete, and I'm so grateful to be able to share this with you. If any of it resonates, just allow yourself to sit with it. Allow it to take root in your body, in your being. If you're feeling called to share this with someone else, then please do so because it might be just the thing that they wanted to hear today. Just the thing that would lift their spirits or just the thing that would support them in feeling heard and in feeling understood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course, if you'd like to stay in touch, there are ways to do so. You can find me on Instagram at the birth warriors. You can reach out to me via email. Hello at nataliefacey.com. And you can also schedule a call with me. So my website, nataliefacey.com, on the contact page, you'll see a link to schedule free consultations, free clarity calls. So definitely take advantage of that. And yeah, I, I welcome positive energy always, as I'm sending you positive energy always. I am wishing you just a fabulous, beautiful, restorative rest of day and i'm wishing for you all that you wish for yourself whether that is rest or slowness or beauty or joy ease expansion love i wish for you all that you wish for yourself thank you for joining me for this next episode as i sit by the window in the big big city and hear just all of the aliveness going on outside Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode.